Today I wanted to focus on the new year. And the scripture that, that I think fits a new year really well is from the last page of the Bible. Revelation chapter 21. And this is written by one of Jesus' disciples, John. He's an old, old man now. He's probably in his 80s. And he's a prisoner of the Roman Empire. Uh, he's in exile on the island of Patmos. And some of you, I think, have been there. It's off the coast of uh, Greece. Uh, and John is in exile. And he has a vision. He has a vision of what God has planned somewhere out in the future. Let's just read the first five verses of this. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them as their God, and they will be his peoples. And God himself will be with them. God will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. For the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Also, he said, write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God for it. So I thought, uh, well, first of all, Happy New Year to all of you. I thought I'd uh, start off with kind of a little post-Christmas show and tell. All right? Uh, I'm kind of excited about my Christmas. My kids combined to give me some of the best gifts I've received in memory. I was absolutely speechless. First of all, something from St. Paul. I have a daughter who lives in England, and uh, she brought a book that was published. Whoa, whoa, whoa. That's Sir Paul. I meant St. Paul, John. There we go. <laughs> Wise guys on the... <laughs> My daughter who lives in England brought home 1,500 pages, the new N.T. Wright commentary, Corey, have you seen this? I got it. <laughs> I'm going to read it this year. Uh, it'll take me the whole year, but I'm going to try and read it. And I'm in a, a learning reading group with a, a group of ministers online. We're going to work our way through N.T. Wright's Paul and the Faithfulness of God. So that alone was a knockout great gift for me. But it wasn't all heavy and hard. Some fun stuff, too. The kids also gave me, now you can go to Sir Paul, The Beatles. There we go. Live at the BBC, both volumes. The first one at the top there was released in 94, and just this fall they came out with volume two, on air live at the BBC. So I've been listening to that. Uh, fantastic stuff. 50th anniversary next month, you know, February 9th, 1964, what happened? I just did it. The Beatles, Ed Sullivan. So that was the second great gift I got. And then Nancy topped it all off by giving me the theologian and political life commentator, Bobby Orr. <laughs> <laughs> and I read this through cover to cover in about four days. It's fantastic. For me, it's a really good read. And what was intriguing for me was uh, Bobby Orr is telling of the disastrous times in his life and his recovery from that. His knees were torn up by age 28. He's had both knees replaced now. He's on titanium. He could not skate after he was 28. He had to retire from hockey, and at about the same time it was discovered his agent, Alan Eagleson, had defrauded him and many others, and Bobby Orr was basically broke at 30. Listen, this is right out of the book. It's not easy to describe the anxiety you feel when the one thing you're good at is taken away from you. The year my health left me, I lost my money, an important friend, Eagleson, who he no longer calls a friend. 
a lifestyle I had grown accustomed to, and a career that meant everything to me. Ahead of me was only uncertainty. Boy, at 30, he thought his life was over. I'll come back to Bobby Orr as we think about the challenges of life for all of us and the way our lives evolve and change with the years and the seasons. How do we handle this flow, this up and down, this flux? How do we handle the the mistakes we've made, the things that happen, the bad times, the good times, the events that could wear us down or wear us out? And particularly, I want to think about this in terms of our faith and what Jesus' team in the past has experienced and endured. Earlier, I read you that scripture from the last page of the Bible where John described the vision of God, God's great future. I gave you a little hint of what was behind that. John's in exile on the island, but... Let me, let me uh, give you the backstory more. From his prison on the Isle of Patmos, John assured the infant Christian church, and this was written about 85 or 90 AD. We don't know exact year, but it's near the end of the first century. And he is assuring the early Christians that God has made this promise to them, specifically to them, because they are an oppressed, persecuted community of believers. Now, I want you to hear this history and think about it. Few times in history have we witnessed such a violent attack on a designated population as what happened under the Roman emperors Nero and Caligula. They sought to obliterate Christianity. We know some of the stories, I'm sure, thrown to the lions in the Colosseum for sport, for entertainment. But let me give you one Nero example. There are many, ranging from the Colosseum, but let me give you just this one. Emperor Nero was an insomniac, couldn't sleep, and often to relax enough to go to sleep, he would like to stroll out in the palace gardens, drinking in the beauty of the plants and flowers, and that helped him relax. They were imported from all over the known world. But at night, when he's trying to go to sleep and he can't, it's hard to see a garden and all its beauties. So you know what he did? He would have Christians tied to big posts, wrap them in straw, wet the straw so it would burn more slowly, and lighted a fire to serve as lamps so he could stroll through and see the flowers. Burning Christians was his lamp to drink in the beauty of nature and help him relax. Nero was probably insane. Most historians now agree on that. But those early believers were a persecuted people, and John wrote to them and said, God has promised to do a new thing on the heels of their suffering, on the heels of what they're experiencing in their life. God would turn their world around and liberate them from their oppressors. Quote, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Behold, I make all things new. Revelation 21. So in that context, what is that verse and what is this thinking say to us as we stand on the front porch of a new year and look out ahead. Among other things, I think it says that on the heels of hard times, and sometimes perhaps even as a result of hard times, God can make our lives new, too. He can give us fresh starts, new possibilities, and second chances. And he can do that in a number of ways several realms of our existence. For example, take the topic of personal relationships. These are the essential ingredients of our lives. Your personal relationships. Your family, your friends, the people you work with, your neighbor. That's what makes your life 
real. And that's the most essential thing. Do you remember Michael Pinball Clemens when he was here back in May? I still remember him down there talking about saying and saying, I'm a turtle on a fence post. Do you remember that? A lot of us scratched our head and what is a turtle on a fence post? And then he explained it. He said, if you ever see a turtle on top of a fence post, you know it didn't get there alone. Somebody helped it, right? I'm a turtle on a fence post. We all, we all are. Well, listen to Bob Yor. He says the same thing. No one is going to succeed without taking their lumps. He doesn't deny that. Then he says, no one is going to succeed on their own either. What sometimes looks like an individual accomplishment is always the result of a team effort. So many of us have good relationships. We do. A lot of you in this room are really blessed. I know your families. I know your friends. You are blessed. So many of us have that, and in this church as well. And Deb talked about that in the announcements, how good it is to have all of the connections and be able to share life. So how can we best live those out, and what should we be paying attention to? What's really important? Got a little video here a drama team put together. Just take a look at this, if you could. Miss the quiet hush before the day began. I miss the sunrise this morning. I miss the smile on your face. I miss the tear fall. I miss the sunset too. I don't mean to throw it all away. I just settle for calm and calm. When I know When I know There's more I missed a chance to hear What you were thinking I'm often thinking of something else And as the days slip by, I'm grasping the shadows of moments past. I don't mean to throw it all away. It ends better, honest. <laughs> and, and while John's uh, retrieving that, I wa I've watched that several times. She's not doing anything wrong at all. That looks like a pretty typical hard-running mom, right? She's multitasking. She's, she's just trying to keep up, right? So um, just keep that in mind if we see the end. <laughs> Almost all of us can point to some failure, and it may not have been a major mess-up. It may just be that life kind of pushed us sideways, like hers. And they can do all kinds of things to us and create all kinds of regrets. And then there are the other big things, perhaps a broken marriage, perhaps a lost friendship. And sometimes these things can be healed, but oftentimes they can't. Time moves on, people move away. Yet always, always, we can learn from those experiences as we build new relationships, new marriages, or new friendships in the future. We can relate to people with greater awareness, sensitivity, with greater kindness in all that we do, having learned in the past the high price of failing to do so. Behold, I make all things new, all things says the Lord. 
And sometimes the future we desire is the result of the past that we regret. Sometimes the future we desire and can shape is the result of the past that we regret. I started with relationships. Let me go to business and finances. John, do you think you have it? Can we? Okay, I'm going to interrupt myself again. You got to see the end of this too. I don't mean to throw it all away. I just settle for commonplace. When I know. When I know there's more Some things you can never do enough Bask in the sunlight By looking at the stars Laugh like a child Giggle till it hurts and murmur, I'm sorry. Listen to the silence. I heard the whisper of God. I had to stop to catch it. I heard the whisper of God. I had to stop to catch it I don't have to say anything else, do I? That said it about relationships. So thanks to uh, Terry Lynn and Gareth and their family and uh, Ryan who put that together. Let me go into from relationships now into uh, business. I sometimes hear about people who are angry with God because of the financial disasters in their lives, the, the economic pressure they're living under. In doing research for the sermon series I'm starting next week, the, the Why series, I came across the case of a man who made a poor investment. He, he put nearly all of his money into a personal small business and everybody advised against it. When the business failed, he was really angry at God. And as he talked with his minister, he was asked what his economic outlook or policy was. And he said, well, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm, I believe in capitalism and the power of the markets. And his minister said to him, okay, let's take God out of the equation for a minute. How would you explain, in those terms, how would you explain the failure of your business? What was the cause? And he said, well, I was probably slightly undercapitalized. I wasn't able to do the marketing I needed to do. I had a hard time competing on price, and customers didn't seem to see the value of my product. And then he was asked, now, what role did God play in this? And he was silent because he knew the answer. God doesn't manipulate markets or force customers to buy products they don't need or want or force people to go to a business or raise salaries or just because someone's a Christian. Your faith won't make you rich, is what I'm saying. But what faith in God offered this man as he worked through his mistake and his failure was the knowledge that despite his business failure, he was not a failure in God's eyes. And later as the man stopped blaming God and began to turn to God, he said he felt, he felt the Lord walking with him. He had been blocking and unaware. He felt the Lord walking with him, and that gave him peace and strength. Bobby Orr, again. Because Bobby Orr was flat broken and in real trouble. He said, Now, past disappointments have all but lost their sting. 
I've made up my earlier losses and recovered in other ways. It took a generation to unfold. It's taken him 35 years to recover, but he's doing fine and doing well. I know I've been lucky twice, once as an athlete and once as a businessman, and both times my good fortune was to have quality people around me. Success is important, but there's no point denying that, but the company you keep is more important. My greatest blessing may be that I have known both. Sometimes in the world of business, past failures become the fodder, the foundation for future success. And lessons learned in our yesterdays ensure the success of our tomorrows. On the heels of our suffering, behold, I make all things new. When we are in economic tight times, we can learn and things can be renewed. Or, the world of politics. I hesitate to go near this, but this is a municipal election year. Friday, the first candidate for mayor announced, the mayor of Hamilton entered the race, big headline on the front of the spectator. Rob Ford's already campaigning for the Toronto mayoralty. Next year, 2015, federal elections will take place and already the advertising's beginning, provincial as well. It's all a grand part of the democratic process, and it's good, but it's an emotionally hard one for those of us who have to listen to the attack ads that go with campaigns. A political commentator on television recently explained that as much as 80% of campaign dollars are spent on negative advertising, trashing your opponent. But this commentator then reported something I found encouraging. He said there is a growing movement among voters called positive politics. And it means a decision not to vote for the attack ads, but rather vote for people who place positive virtues and positive vision as part of their policy. Wouldn't it be wonderful, wouldn't it be refreshing this year if some of the candidates practiced only positive politics? Wouldn't it be inspiring to hear from individuals who address issues that confront us without vilifying the other guy, seeking the same office as they are? I know that sounds like a rose-colored pipe dream, but maybe this, maybe this time some of them will take seriously what Jesus taught, this is my commandment that you love one another. We may not always agree. We may have different goals and ideologies in our political agendas. But love calls for civil discourse and discussion that builds peace among people rather than war and discord. I like the idea that there is a growing number of people now calling for positive politics. Theirs is a collective voice that believes God can still make all things new. And boy, this year ahead, as we have all of these elections, probably in the next 18 months, I'm really hoping. And I hope you will, too, and pray for it. Or finally, we talked about relationships, finances, and business, politics. Finally, there's the matter of faith. Most of us know that uh, we've been mediocre at best in our spiritual lives, dabbling, exploring a bit, but not really diligent or effective. Yeah, we're into church. We're interested in this stuff, but we're not always tight with God personally. We're not our spiritual best. And I'm saying we... Some of you will recall me saying that even Billy Graham, now 96 years old, Billy says he wishes he had traveled and spoken less and stayed home and studied and studied the Bible and prayed more. Even Billy Graham. So don't beat yourself up too much. Just know that you're never too old to get tighter with God. 
or to get more comfortable in your faith. And some of us really need to. A year passed, I received a letter from one of our Wellington Square folk. I shared this Christmas Eve, so I'm hoping you remember it. But I want to share it again before we uh, leave it. Listen. This was the letter I got. Good morning, Orville. I just have to share some good news with you. You don't, you don't know me other than I'm sitting out there on Sunday mornings a lot of weeks. And I actually, um, the writer is correct. I know the name, but I could not point out. Goes on to say, I've been struggling to cope with issues in my life for a very long time and have asked myself and God over and over again. At one point, you mentioned some devotional booklets that were available. I got one. The minute I opened that book and read on day two a scripture verse where God says, quote, and this is from the Psalms, you are precious in my sight. I have inscribed you on the palms of my hand. And she writes, I felt so very different when I read that. I felt the love of God and Jesus. I'd begun a journey not about me and my troubles, but about searching for daily guidance from God. I started really practicing daily conversations with God, actually many times a day and in some very odd places. When I do talk to this writer, I want to ask about that. What, what odd places have you been praying goes on, however, for the first time in a long time, I'm beginning to feel peace in my heart and soul. Daily, I try to do something good for someone without them knowing it was me. And that feels good. Daily now, I ask God and Jesus to guide me. And when I stumble, pick me up and dust me off, help me start all over again. And the letter ends, thank God for making someone like me precious in God's eyes, precious in God's sight. Behold, I make all things new. It happens. The fulfillment of one of Scripture's great promises. And it happens and can continue to happen for all of us in every realm of our lives, whether it is our personal lives uh, our business and, and financial, I hope in our political life in this country and especially in our faith lives, it happens. On the heels of our struggles, sorrows, and suffering, and sometimes even as a result of our sorrows and suffering, God helps us construct a new future that is rich and fulfilling. That's God offered to us as we step into a new year. Whatever is past, is past and gone. We do not have to remain what or who we wear. Drink deeply at the fountain of faith, and there we will learn that by the grace of God, he can make all things new, and all of us new. Let us pray. Dear God, in this month of new beginnings, pour out your spirit on our world, in our personal relationships, our professional endeavors, our political arena, our private lives of faith. Let that which was, which was be transformed into that which ought to be. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And as you go into this Week, month, year ahead, know that the Lord God who makes all things new is with you. And there are fresh possibilities, second chances, and new starts ahead when God is with you. Thanks be to God. Amen.